long-suffering. Dear Father, you're so good to us. Lord, we are excited to be in your house and revival, Father. And we pray, we pray for Stephen tonight as he comes and he gives us the message that it'll touch the lives in these seats tonight, Lord, that we'll be better Christians and someone may come to know you this very evening. I pray for your blessings on this family group tonight. Let them feel free, dear God, and let us sit back and enjoy your love and your mercy. In your precious name, and amen. All right, guys. Two, three, Well, folks, it's good to be here, and uh, we're going to start off with two back-to-back -back here. Jesus holding my hand, and I'm feeling mighty fine, and uh, before we do that, I want to introduce John Grubb. I, some of you may not know him. Most of you know us. Uh, we've been here several times. We go to church here and all that stuff, but he's from Ohio. <laughs> <You know. laughs> but he's a nice guy you know he is he's got a passport and everything he's legal to be over here and uh, oh, but it expires we, at dark we tried to rename the group Jean, Don and the Canterbury's but they didn't go for it they won't go for it but we're going to try to do four or five for you tonight and I'm going to try to do one I, I don't know I usually can't get through it without breaking up but <laughs> we'll give her a try. Jesus, hold my hand and the feeling fine. Jesus, 
took all my oxygen. <laughs> and I wasn't even singing. <laughs> I told Bobby out there to lock the door when he heard me start singing. So you can't get out. <laughs> hey, man, I got you. <laughs> I'm the only one in this group that's ever got an ovation. Got three of them, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I want to do one for you tonight. You know, the pastor talked this morning about losing his wife. Some of you here know some of my background. Maybe some of you don't. But in 2000, my oldest daughter, Wendy Dawn, was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. They gave her about three years to live max. And uh, that was devastating. Two years later, my wife was diagnosed <clears throat> with cancer. She went to the hospital, fine doctor, Dr. Nolan over here, and he'd done surgery, and he come in, and he told us, he said, I got her all. He said, you don't need, you know, <laughs> you don't need anything. You don't need radiation, chemo, anything. I got it all. And she had a three-day stay in the hospital from the surgery. When we was getting ready to leave, my wife had a heart attack and died. She died two days later. And uh, so, Brother Cook, I know what it's like to wonder why, you know. She was a good Christian girl, loved to sing, had a beautiful voice. And uh, I've never openly questioned God why. I'm like Brother Cook, but I've wondered why, you know. When there's other people out here living like the devil and being blessed. But this song kind of answers a lot of those questions. I've done it here a couple times. Some of you probably heard it. And the, na the name of it is If You Only Knew.
is present with the Lord. I'm in the arms of Jesus now, and I'm not suffering anymore. Hand in hand, we'll stroll together. a big celebration if you only knew if you only knew I'm just going home your prayers have been answered my sickness is gone Lighthouse. A lot of you know that one. If you want to sing along with him, I wouldn't do that. You might throw him off. <laughs> no, you feel free. Amen. <laughs>
We got a treat for you now. Come on, babies. They don't talk much. <laughs> you go a lot, though. You better do good. I'm the judge, remember? I know you have to hold your mic. Okay. Just stand up and Okay. You might turn them mics down a notch because they're loud. Wait, what? what? Okay. Well, oh, here. Tom, what? Tom? Yeah. This one's too little. I'll fix it. This one's. Mommy, this one's too little. Too little. Yeah, that one's bad. <laughs> That's very loud. It's too little. Hey, I had that one earlier. Did you get one too? Yeah.
with us. Great job. That was worth the whole show. I'm looking forward to hearing from Brother Steve tonight. It's been a sweet time of fellowship and catching up, and, and uh, God's taken our lives, both of us, in different directions, but you find that you have a lot of things in common when you serve the Lord. And uh, I hope that you were blessed by this morning's message, and I'm looking forward to what God's going to do. Brother, come up here and let me pray with you before you preach and uh, share with us tonight. No, but I took him to lunch. I'm not, I'm not telling you where we went, but he might be preaching in Chinese tonight. I'm not sure. So. Father, thank you for my brother. Thank you so much for what he means to me and the blessing he was to us in the church this morning. Use him tonight. Just fill him with your Holy Spirit. Put your words in his mouth and his heart. And may he speak with power and authority. And may that word reach our hearts and our lives. And may we respond in faith. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother. Well, it's good to be back this evening. Thank you for having me, church. Uh, thank you for being such an encouragement to me this morning. So many of you uh, stopped by and uh, to shake my hand, to hug my neck, and, and to say that you enjoyed uh, the service this morning. I was very blessed uh, to be able to uh, be with you here at uh, New Hope uh, Bible Baptist Church. Uh, I did have a, uh, Brother Tim over here. <coughs> Brother Mel asked uh, Brother Tim uh, Moses if he had ever heard me preach before, and Brother Tim said, no, but I heard him try three times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was born in Kentucky, raised in Ohio, educated in West Virginia, so I'm a confused Appalachian. I fit right in with you all, don't I? Amen. It's great to be here. Thank you for, many of you bought a book this morning um, called The Desire of My Eyes, Our Journey from Courtship to Cancer. Again, if you weren't here this morning, this book serves as a twofold purpose. Uh, one, it serves as a tribute to my uh, my dear uh, faithful wife, uh, I really appreciated the group singing uh, the song uh, about the, uh, the fellow's uh, wife and, and wondering why, you know. And of course, I know that uh, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love us. Amen? So what a wonderful place. My wife has been eternally eternally healed and uh, so for that I'm very grateful I'm just a little bit selfish I miss my wife and uh, it's uh, not quite the same without her but uh, God gives grace there is no end to the grace of God and for that I'm grateful this book serves as a tribute to her to my wife Cozy and uh, secondly it serves uh, as a ministry help uh, to those who are going through the grieving process, going through losing the loss of, uh, they're losing someone that they loved uh, like I have. So I'm not the only person who's ever lost a wife, but it's the first time I ever lost a wife, and I'm not real happy about it. So uh, I'm looking forward to tonight. So if you uh, are excited about prophecy, if you, if you want to know something about what's going on in the world, uh, there are so many prophecies that are unfolding before uh, our eyes today that it, uh, it almost boggles the mind. And uh, so I've had people uh, ask me questions from all around the world. Uh, 
what does this mean? What does that? I don't have the answers to all these questions, but I know I have the book that has all the answers, and, and so I'm trying to figure it all out. So tonight I want to begin looking at Matthew chapter 24, <coughs> verse number 1, very familiar prophetic uh, chapter of God's Word, and it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him uh, the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. Now that word world um, means age. Uh, there will never be an end of the world, but there will be an, age, an end to this particular age. Uh, today we're living in what I call the dispensation of grace or the church age. And uh, there are other dispensations. We won't get into all of that, but that's what he's talking about. What, when will this particular age in and Jesus answered and said unto them take heed this is a warning take heed that no man deceive you for many shall come in my name saying I am Mashiach I am the Messiah the Christ all the same word and shall deceive many and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars I love this verse here verse 6 see that you be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. As bad as things have gotten, as bad as things are going to get, keep Matthew 24, 6 close by, near your heart. See that you be not troubled. That's what Jesus said. See that you be not troubled. I'm not here to scare people to death, but I'm here to give them some uh, understanding of these scriptures. And Jesus says, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Listen, uh, this, this guy right here, this next guy here is George Burns. How many of you remember watching him on television? Okay, uh, You're telling me how old you are, right? Okay. Uh, he made this comment. It's a great comment. I look to the future because that's where I'll spend the rest of my life. And I thought, wow, how appropriate when we're studying prophecy. Uh, you know, somebody said, well, are you worried about Antichrist? No, I'm not worried about Antichrist. I know Jesus Christ. Amen? If you know Jesus Christ, you don't have to be worried about Antichrist. And, but uh, as we look to the future, keep in mind that we're living in uh, exciting times. We're living in a time when prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes. As you watch the news and hold your Bible in one hand, or a magazine in another, and a newspaper in one hand, the Bible in the other. It's incredibly uh, amazing as we watch the Bible unfolding before our very eyes. And the more you know about what the Bible has to say concerning prophecy, the more you'll be able to connect the dots and understand. One-third of the Bible is prophetic in nature. Somebody says, well, I don't like to listen to prophecy. Well, then you don't like one-third of the Bible because God has provided us benchmarks along the way so that we can see where we're at on God's prophetic uh, calendar. And, uh, of course, there are many today that believe the world is falling apart. And uh, when you look at some of the things going on, if you weren't a Christian, you'd probably say the same thing. The world's falling apart. It's coming apart at the seams. But rather than saying that the world is falling apart, I believe that we could actually say that the world is falling into place. Uh, what we're seeing has been prophesied. We ought not to be worried. We ought not to be alarmed. We ought not to be surprised when we see what's going on on planet Earth today. Let's look at some different uh, prophecies. Let's look at some different things that uh, give us insight on how the world is falling into place. Uh, even secular scientists today uh, are predicting an impending doom, believe that or not. Uh, there's something called the uh, Doomsday Clock, put out by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And actually, it goes all the way back to 1947, 
but uh, on January 22nd, 2015, they predicted that we were three minutes to midnight. Uh, they moved the clock forward. They, you know, we're three minutes to midnight. In other words, they're saying that there was something that's going to happen that's going to be catastrophic in this world. Now, this, these are not preachers. These are not uh, scholars of the Bible. These are intellectual uh, people that are scientists in certain fields. And one of the things that they do is they, they watch uh, different events and they gauge by the temperature of the climate of the, of the world some different things that are going on, whether or not uh, the world is going to face some great disaster. On January 24th, this year, these same scientists predicted that it's now two minutes to midnight. So just in a span of uh, four years, from 2015 to 2019, they have moved the clock, and we're now two minutes to midnight. It's as if we have a two-minute warning. Two minutes to midnight. Think about that. What would you do if the Lord Jesus were to return in two minutes? Where would you spend eternity? Uh, if you're not saved, I can tell you where you're going to spend eternity. You say, well, I'll, I'll just wait till Jesus comes, then I'll get saved. I don't think you can do that. I really don't. If you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it seems to uh, suggest that because you obeyed not the truth, that you will be deceived and believe a lie and be damned according to the Bible. Two minutes to midnight. If you knew the Lord was coming back in two minutes, how would your life change? If you knew it was coming back if the Lord was coming back tomorrow, would it make a difference in your life today? And if so, there's something wrong with your life today. And that's what I want you to consider. As we look at how the world is not falling apart, it's falling into place. It ought to reinforce our faith in the Word of God. It ought to reveal to us exactly what's going on and show us that God's word is truth. This doesn't contain truth. It is truth. Amen. And it's important for us to see that. So let's look at some different biblical uh, perspectives uh, in relation to current events today. Let's begin by looking at the prophecy in Ezekiel 37. Maybe you're familiar with that, maybe not. But in, actually in Ezekiel 36 and 37, we have uh, the same theme. And especially in Ezekiel 37, let's look at what the Bible says. It says in Ezekiel 37, verse 7, So I prophesied, this is Ezekiel the prophet speaking, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath of life in them world is he talking about here? He's talking about a valley of dry bones coming together bone to bone, sinews and flesh but notice the last part of verse 8. There is no breath of life in them. That's significant. In verse 10 so I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and stood up on their feet an exceeding great army Verse 11, and then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Wow. This morning I told you that Israel is God's timepiece. If you want to know what time it is in God's prophetic calendar, you have to look at that tiny little country the size of New Jersey. Hour and a half wide by car, five hours long by car, but 5,779 years deep in history. When we look at the nation of Israel, it's God's timepiece. You can see why that tiny little country is constantly in the news. Today, Israel has a homeland. That's significant. That's significant. And as we look at this nation of Israel, keep in mind Isaiah 66 and verse 8 prophesied that Israel would become, become a nation in a day. And this sign alone, this sign alone ought to help us understand that we are certainly living in the last days. 
The fact that Israel today, after 2,000 years of being dispersed around the world, enough uh, Jewish people have returned to the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in our generation. And today they have a homeland that was established on May 14, 1948. At that time, when Israel returned, there was nothing but a barren wasteland. There were swamps. And when the Jews come back to the land of Israel, they planted eucalyptus trees. They, uh, they, they developed means by which to improve the land, uh, to, to come there to the Middle East and try to plant crops. Well, it took some ingenuity. And the Jews are just the right people to provide the ingenuity that's necessary. And so they began to irrigate the land. They began to fertilize the land. They began to work the land. But Ezekiel 36, verses 34 through 36, tell us that when the Jews would return, it would be a barren wasteland. Look at what the Bible says. And they shall say, this land was desolate. This land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate, notice, and the ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Boy, I tell you, every time I go to Israel, I remember what Ezekiel said in chapter 36. Because what I see in Israel, I see five different harvests taking place in Israel every year. One harvester's coming through, another one's disking the land, another one's planting crops right in a row. It's like a convoy. And they just, time after time after time, they are producing crops in the Jezreel Valley. That's where the Valley of Armageddon is. And today, Israel exports a billion dollars worth of fruit and produce to their enemies. To their enemies. Keep in mind, Israel, there are 14.8 million Jews in the world. There are 6.8 million Jews living in Israel. Less than half of the Jews worldwide live in Israel. 6.8 million Jews are surrounded by 250 million Arabs, most of whom hate them. The fact that Israel exists today is a modern-day miracle. But Isaiah 27.6 tells us a prophecy that's already been fulfilled. Israel today is exporting and selling fruit and produce to their enemies surrounding them. Look at what Isaiah said. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. And that's exactly what they're doing today. It's not uncommon to see uh, an Arab truck uh, in Jordan and uh, an Israeli truck in Israel, back up on the Ben-Gurion Bridge, lay their weapons down, uh, exchange goods uh, for money, and then get back in their trucks, drive back across the opposite sides, and then, you know, stand guard in case they have to fight one another. It's not, un it's not uncommon to see that anymore. I have pictures when uh, we're at uh, Yasser El Yehud, which is uh, the baptismal site, not the traditional baptismal site, uh, outside of Tiberias, that's Catholic tradition, but rather the traditional, uh, the, the biblical, more biblical uh, baptismal site where Jesus was baptized by John the baptizer is outside of Jericho. And that's where I take my people. And, and uh, it's so interesting because you can see on the Israeli side, Israeli soldiers, I always have my pictures made with them, and then a, across the the creek, and that's what it looks like. It looks like a crick, you know, as we say in, in, in Appalachia, a crick. And, uh, and there are soldiers, Jordanian soldiers over there who are Muslim for the most part, watching us baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing to see that because you could take a rock and throw it across to hit one of the soldiers. They're that close. It's less than the width of this building here. Incredible, incredible. <clears throat> Today there is an increase of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is 
a hatred for Jewish people. And this, this is a, a, a certain um, benchmark that we're seeing. Uh, the Bible is very clear uh, that the world will hate the Jewish people. Uh, Numbers 23.9, I shared with you this morning uh, that, that the Jews would be a people that would dwell alone and not be reckoned among the nation. Even in the American government, we have those today who are anti-Semitic. Now, I have no problem saying that because it's wrong. God said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And if we want God's curse, then all we have to do is keep electing people into our office that hate the Jew. And, and God will certainly accommodate America. Somebody asked me, where's America in prophecy? <coughs> I said, well, it's mentioned 800 times in the Bible. They said, what? I said, yeah, the USA is mentioned 800 times in the Bible. It's right in the middle of Jerusalem, J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M. <laughs> USA, right in the middle of Jerusalem. But the fact of the matter is, the United States not mentioned in end-time prophecy. Number one, probably because it wasn't a nation back in the day when it was being, the Bible was being written. <coughs> but more importantly, I think that uh, it's very possible that we won't be significant at that time. I don't know. If the rapture occurs, what country would be most affected? Possibly the United States. Uh, so there's a lot of different answers I could give you for that question. Where is America in prophecy? But I do know that God said he would uh, destroy all nations that forget him. And so we need to be very careful about that. If the people, if, uh, where Moses said, Lo, my people that uh, well, shall dwell alone and not be reckoned among the nation. Never has that been any more true than what it is today. It's incredible the way that the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, are treated uh, when you talk about worldwide treatment of the Jews. Uh, today, anti-Semitism is on the rise. Uh, Jewish cemeteries are being defaced uh, by people who hate the Jew, swastikas and things like that. Then you have what's called the BDS movement, and you have people in the American Congress who want to support the BDS movement. Uh, that's boycott divestment and sanctions against the, uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, back in the fourth century when the Catholic Church was started by Constantine, he said all Christians should divest themselves from the detestable company of the Jews. And anti-Semitism entered into the Catholic Church. Later on there were popes that apologized for that. But the fact of the matter is that's what the BDS movement is. It's anti-Israel, it's anti-Semitic anti-Jewish anything. And so people are being uh, encouraged to uh, do away with uh, doing business with the Jewish people. Matter of fact, most of Europe is following along with this BDS uh, movement. It's very sad. Today Israel is threatened on all sides. And when you think about all sides, think about there. There's Israel surrounded by Egypt and Jordan and Gaza and Syria and Lebanon. Then you got Saudi Arabia and uh, and, and, you know, you got Iran just above and Iraq just above. And, and, and it doesn't take long to figure out that they're sitting in a hotbed, aren't they? And God's got his hand right there on top of them. United Nations, a precursor of the one world government or one world system today. And again, that's very <laughs> prophetic, isn't it? Because there's coming a day when there's going to be a world dictator, this man of sin, son of perdition, the beast, uh, the antichrist, as we call him, yeah. is going to rule and uh, usurp the authority uh, of God, if you will, in Jerusalem. Uh, the United Nations building in New York City uh, is one of the most anti-Semitic organizations in the world. In Israel, they don't call it the United Nation. They call it the United Nothing. Seriously. This is their treatment of the Jews. Uh, Israel's mistreated by the United Nations. It's the only UN member whose existence is constantly challenged by the United Nations. It's the only UN member targeted for annihilation by another UN state. It's the only member whose capital is not recognized by other nations except America. Praise God. This past December, I took 48 people to Israel, and we have a group picture in front of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Only nation, amen. 
It's the only nations whose defeated enemies insist on dictating the terms of peace. It's the only UN member condemned by the World Health Organization as a violator of health rights. And that's the most laughable of all because it's the Jews who developed most of the great medical breakthroughs today. Uh, if you've had a polio vaccine, thank a Jew for that. If, you're, uh, if you've ever used a SIDS monitor, a sudden infant death syndrome monitor to guard against your child dying in the middle of the night asleep, you can thank a Jewish person for that because that, again, uh, is just one of the many uh, different things that uh, the Jewish people have developed and been a blessing to the world. I talked about the BDS uh, movement uh, and and. This last one, it's the only UN member not permitted to rotate onto the UN Security Council. Think about that. It's the most powerful military in the Middle East. But they can't be on the Security Council? And Iran just rotated off of the Security Council a few years ago? And you, listen, Iran is a state uh, sponsor of terrorism. And Israel can't be, uh, it's a democracy. But that's the United Nations, or as they say, the, the not United Nothing. Eli Wiesel said, we have learned to trust the threats of our enemies more than the promises of our friends. Wow. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? We have learned to trust the threats of our enemy more than the promises of our friends. Listen, the Jews, when you go to Israel on a, on a tour, I can assure you this. When you go to Israel, huh, wow, they don't play. If they say stop and they're pointing an Uzi at you, you stop because they're not playing. I feel very safe when I go to Israel. Uh, I feel very safe. Safer than I do in most U.S. large cities. The days of Noah, the Bible speaks of the days of Noah. Of course, I believe the days of Noah are upon us. Uh, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the so coming of the Son of Man be. And, and of course, that's in Matthew 24 and verse 37. And we've heard people talk about, well, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. In Listen, folks, if the Lord doesn't do something soon, I believe that uh, the, the days of Noah are already upon us. How can it get much worse? Uh, I believe that we're living on the brink of the return of Christ. And uh, I believe that with all my heart. Today, evil is glorified in TV and movies and music and clothing and video games. You know, they want to know why children today are going into schools and shooting their classmates. Well, have you ever watched some of the video games that are being sold to our children today? I, I mean, it, you have to be brain dead not to understand that that these video games are not good for your children. Uh, these video games where people are shooting up and killing everybody and stealing cars. And, and I mean, come on, folks. You know, if that's what you're pouring into your kid, don't expect something else come out of him. And, and you know, it, again, bottom line, all of this, even politics today, Evil is being glorified. And you say, well, how so? Well, just four years ago at the White House, this is what the White House looked when it was adorned with gay pride colors. Does the Bible address homosexuality? Uh, you know, you may not like that. Don't care. The Bible addresses it. And make no mistake about it. It's better to please God rather than to please man. And I'm just saying to you that homosexuality is a sin. Make no mistake about it. The Bible speaks about it. Going after strange flesh is a sin. And when the Bible talks about uh, evil and good and light and darkness, that same year, Kali was displayed on the outside of the Empire State Building. Who's Kali? That's a Hindu goddess symbolizing death, darkness, and destruction. And look at what Isaiah said. He said, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness. We're living in a day that is as bad or worse than the days of Noah. The stage is being set for a one-world leader, 
And of course, we know that that's scriptural, but there are those today that think a new world order is the savior of earth. And that's what we need is a new world order. Uh, today, there are people that want to become a global, a, um, a, a global economy, have a global economy. We all want to have a one world currency. Uh, we ought to have a, a one world banking system. Uh, have you ever heard of that? Well, when you think about the Bilderbergers, that's exactly what they're promoting. The Bilderbergers. Who in the world is the Bilderberger? These are people who are very influential, powerful people. People who are kings and queens and prime ministers and CEOs of corporations. And they have formed a group called the Bilderbergers because they met in the Bilderberger mansion uh, when they first had their meeting. And and, and, and this particular group, it's not Democrat or Republican, it's not even American, it is worldwide. And these are people who are interested in establishing a new world order. President George W. or George Bush Sr., uh, he was, uh, when he was president, he talked about a new world order as something good. It's anything but good. It's anything but good. He was wrong. Uh, when uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton went missing after he was elected, can I, t I can tell you where they were at. They were in Chantilly, Virginia, attending a Bilderberger meeting. And so it's not Democrat and Republican, it's power. It's power, make no mistake about it. And I don't have time to talk about all the particulars, but you can Google this on the internet and learn all you want. What about a cashless society? Well, that's part of the idea of a, a one world government, a one world dictator. Uh, when the Antichrist comes here, and you can read this in, in, uh, in Revelation 13, you find that uh, anyone who uh, you know, wants to buy or sell, well, there are some rules that he's going to establish. Today they are uh, using something called bitcoins. I don't know what a bitcoin is. Uh, I know it's some type of virtual money. It's not like real money, but this is a cashless society. As a matter of fact, the CEO of Apple declares that one day soon that, that, that our children will not even know what money is because uh, you, you can't use it. We've already gone to put microchips in our credit cards and and uh, it won't be long before they'll be putting microchips in you. I'm not kidding. There's something called the uh, RDIF, the Radio Frequency Implanted Device. And this, uh, this is like a microchip that's been, it was larger at one time, but they've scaled it down now to the size uh, uh, of the head of a pin, and they can actually insert it under your skin uh, with a syringe. And, uh, and, and the, the technology there and the uses of that, some of them are very good. For instance, if you have a dog, uh, and dogs are very expensive, uh, then you, you insert one of these microchips. If your dog goes running off or someone steals your dog, uh, you can call a company like OnStar, you know, with the car, and you can say, hey, you know, find Fido. I don't know where Fido's at. And they can zero in within one square meter where Fido's at using satellite technology in outer space. That's great. What about your children being abducted? Um, you know, you've, you've heard and watched movies of children that have been abducted and buried a, in a box uh, alive. And, and you know, wouldn't it be nice if you had uh, the technology that could find your child before they died? Of course it would be good. And, and those are good uses of that type of technology. But my goodness, give that same technology to the Antichrist. Now, you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast on your forehead or in your forehand. What about the rise of delusions? Well, there's a lot of delusions out there. Second Thessalonians talks about it for this cause. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And they all might be damned who believe not the truth, uh, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, here's some delusions. How about this one? Islam is peaceful. Well, it's anything but peaceful. Now, I'm not saying that every Muslim is a terrorist, but a whole lot of terrorists are Muslim. I can tell you that. Uh, guns are evil. Well, when, you know, God didn't blame the rock that Cain used to kill Abel. God blamed Cain. And, and the same thing is true about guns. Guns haven't killed anybody. It's the people holding the gun and using the gun that kills people. Climate change is more than more dangerous than uh, jihadists. Well, 
I've yet to have climate change cut my head off uh, or, anybody, or seen climate change cut anyone's head off. What about Israel as a bad guy? Well, I, I'd beg to differ, and I don't have time to go into all of the reasons why, but there's a lot of Palestinians who would love to be uh, under um, Israeli rule uh, or governing. Uh, is ISIS, uh, or uh, excuse me, uh, ISIS isn't Islam. Wow, I, I think it is. I think it is. Um, Palestinians are persecuted. No, they're not persecuted. Uh, they're squatters is what they are. God gave that land to Israel. Make no mistake about it. That land belongs to Israel. Israel's never had more than one-third of the land that God gave to them. And they're going to have it all. And Muslim refugees are good for the Western world. Uh, like I said this morning, you got, you got Muslim uh, living in America who are mad because, and they're protesting because Americans walk their dog in public. And according to Sharia law, that's not allowed. Well, who, I really don't care. America, love it or leave it, you know. That's how I feel about it. I'm kind of a more crass than most politicians are, I guess. What about the decline of morality? Uh, and because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. That's what the Bible says, Matthew 24, 12. Because iniquity shall abound. That means iniquity, sinfulness, evil, depravity, because that abounds. You know what happens to Christians? Your love shall wax cold. You get desensitized. God help us not to get desensitized. Sin is still sin. God has never changed his mind once about sin. It's still sin that causes death, and death by sin. And so death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned. It's still sin that caused God to so love the world, to send his only begotten son into this world, to taste death for every man. It's still sin that causes man to, not to be able to fellowship with God. And the only way that we can have fellowship with God is to have our sin debt canceled. And that's in Jesus Christ. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the only begotten Son of God. And because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. I believe iniquity abounds more today than at any other time in our lives. I really do. And it's going to get worse. Cheer up, Jeremiah. Things are going to get worse. Only in America are those who exposed planned parenthood for harvesting and selling body parts of fetuses prosecuted instead of those who were doing the harvesting. What's wrong with that picture? Now, I know West Virginia still allows abortion. I'm sorry. They shouldn't because abortion is murder. David said, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. At the moment of conception, life begins. There are seven people named in the Bible in which God named before they were ever birthed through the canal. I want a Lamborghini. That's the head of Planned Parenthood, Dr. Mary Gatter. And she's talking about negotiating the price of fetus parts. Interesting. Planned Parenthood says, Our unborn babies are not human, but their body parts are. I don't have time to go into all of that any deeper, but uh, look at Ezekiel 37, or excuse me, 38 and 39. And we find that there's a prophecy that I believe is probably the most relevant prophecy in the Bible in our day. Gog of Magog is on the move. Uh, the bear's not dead, he's just hibernating. I'll never forget the first time I went to Ukraine, right after the fall of communism. And the last thing my wife said to me, was the first thing I remembered when I got to Ukraine. She said, don't do something stupid, Steve, and get sent to Siberia in the salt mines. <laughs> I, got off the, I got off the airplane, uh, Austrian Airlines, 
And uh, when I got off of the Austrian Airlines uh, plane, I, I decided I wanted to take a picture. And these soldiers were there to check all of our documents. And uh, so I took this picture of Austrian Airlines, got over here, and we were standing in line, and we walked into the, uh, <laughs> you know, into the airport to go through passport control and, and then security and all of that. And these two soldiers walked up and grabbed me by the arm spun me around and walked me backwards toward the front door and I thought well I haven't even been here five minutes that I'm already being arrested by these Russian soldiers and I you know I spent time in the National Guard so I had a disdain for Russian soldiers to begin with and they're wearing these big saucer caps these green saucer caps with a big red band around it and they were distinctly communist and uh, I wasn't crazy about communists that's the way I was trained in the military and uh they, they said, camera. And I said, yes, that's my camera. Thank you very much. He said, camera. I said, no, it's my camera, and you're not getting it. And he looked at me, and he says, camera. You know, and I'm like, it's on, you know. <laughs> it's on. We're going to rumble right here in the airport in, in Nipopetrov, Ukraine. And finally, they went and got somebody else that could speak English, and he says, um, uh, film no pictures and so they took the film out of my camera and uh you know, that avoided uh, world war three in my lifetime but <laughs> i was about ready to you know uh lay down the you know whatever it took you know uh, to get my point across the bear is not dead he's hibernating think about what would happen in america if christians made up a sign that said behead those who insult Jesus. What, what, what would happen? What would the news have to say about that? And, and what would others say about Christianity? But today we see signs like this. Behead those who insult Islam. And nothing is ever made to be a big deal. When you think about, look at all of those different uh, sites that you see in those pictures. And think about this. Every one of those pictures that I'm showing you, like this picture here, blocking the streets, praying toward Mecca. Every one of these pictures that I'm showing you are from Russia. Not from some Middle Eastern country. These are taking place in Russia. Why? Because 35% of Russia's population has become Muslim. Not only that, Vladimir Putin is making uh, uh, new alliances with, uh, this was the, the, the president of Turkey. Uh, this is uh, the president of Syria, uh, Bashar Assad. And this is Al Ayatollah uh, of, of Iran. And, and notice that Vladimir Putin is going out of his way to befriend these Muslim leaders. Why? 35% of his country is Muslim. But not only that, looking at Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, we find out that uh, Russia is going to play a major role in end time prophecy. Uh, Ukraine, just recently, and I, was, I just spent three weeks in Ukraine. I was 120 miles from the fighting. Uh, in Nepopetrov, Ukraine, where they're fighting in Mariupol and Donetsk. I have actually preached, preached tent meetings there, walked the streets and passed out uh, literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of gospel literature. Not only that, but have seen uh, thousands of people saved in Ukraine. Uh, Russia uh, today is proactively uh, testing the defenses of NATO, both in Western Europe and also to the northwest of our mainland. Vladimir Putin is setting the stage for an end time invasion of Israel. According to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, this end time alliance is made up of countries that exist today. Keep in mind that it's what we call specific predictive prophecy. These are not just countries. These are specifically mentioned countries. For instance, Persia, that's Iran today. They still speak 
Farsi or Persian. Uh, when it talks about uh, uh, Tagarma, uh, it talks about Turkey. When it talks about uh, Gog of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, these are parts of Russia. Uh, when it talks about Gomer, it's talking about parts of uh, that area uh, known as Turkey today as well. So all of these different countries are specifically mentioned. And then this morning I mentioned Gershon Solomon and the idea of building a third temple. Uh, so significant in this last day because during the, the time of Jacob's trouble, during the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, what we call the tribulation, though the Bible doesn't call it the tribulation, only the second half is called the great tribulation. Uh, the first three and a half years is not called anything, really, except for the fact that it's part of Jacob, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, when, when you see the talk of building a new uh, temple, and you see the talk of the uh, rabbis being trained and being fitted for their garment. But keep this in mind. Last year, on September the 5th, a red heifer was born. Now, they've had a couple of other heifers in the past, but they were disqualified because uh, they developed more than three hairs that were not red. And so a, a, a committee, if you will, a board of rabbis uh, inspected this, this new red heifer uh, one week after its birth, and they officially declared it to, be, to meet the standards of the Bible concerning the ashes of the red heifer. And some of you may or may not be familiar with the ashes of red heifer, but if you go back to the book of Numbers, you can read the, about the ashes of the red heifer. And it was a, uh, it, the purpose of the ashes was a purification for sin. In other words, they have to have the ashes of the red heifer before they can reinstitute sacrificial worship in the temple. A group of rabbis recently from Israel came and visited uh, President Bush in Washington, D.C., um, and they asked him to consider including uh, the rebuilding of a third temple as part of the deal of the century. Tuesday, they're having uh, an election for the prime minister of Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu, I believe, is one of the wisest men on earth, um, except for maybe his wife. I'm not sure he was very wise in selecting her. But anyway, uh, he is a very wise and good leader for Israel. And uh, he's a very hardcore man, and I hope he's reelected. But regardless, um, there will be an election on Tuesday. Uh, without Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, it's going to change the deal of the century quite a bit. What about perilous times? The Bible is very clear about perilous times. It says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And of course, we know that we're living in dangerous, perilous times. Evil men as seducers. Uh, are waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What about the Muslims? Well, they want to usher in what's called the era of Mahdi. Mahdi. Who in the world is Mahdi? Well, Mahdi is a Muslim messiah. And uh, they believe that Mahdi will come and unite all of the Muslim world together and that the Muslim world will uh, overpower the rest of the world and uh, basically... Uh, convert everyone to Islam, and live under what's called Sharia law. That's not a good thing. And when you study about Mahdi, what the Muslims think of Mahdi, keep this in mind. Everything that they say about Mahdi perfectly lines up with the Antichrist. It's almost identical what they believe. So this is what they're looking for. And, uh, of course, we're living in perilous times. What about MS-13? Uh, these face tattoos of these gang members. These people are putting, the, there are thousands of thousands of these people that's come across our borders illegally from Honduras and other, uh, Guatemala and other places in South America have come up through the southern border, and now they are striking terror in the hearts of Americans. Long Island, New York, is infested with MS-13. Uh, they have killed so many people in that city alone. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, this is the head of ISIS. He's been in hiding for the past five years. 
He's like um, you know, a rat in a cave. And Abu Bakr Shikawa, uh, this is the man who's head of Boko Haram. And remember in Nigeria, these people went down and they kidnapped all of these schoolgirls and sold them as sex slaves. Uh, my friend, troublesome times are here. Some of you are looking like, man, how depressing is this? Remember Matthew 24, 6. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Question, is the world falling apart or falling into place? I believe we have to say it's falling into place because the Bible mentions most of everything that's going on in the world today. See that you be not troubled. Please remember that. See that you be not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. What do we do in the meantime? Well, the Bible says the field is the world. We ought to be out spreading the gospel. There ought to be a sense of urgency about the day in which we're living. Salvation is urgent, and we ought to be urgent also. Amen? We ought to be telling people about Jesus. And I, I want to finish, if I can, by talking about this particular statue. This statue here... Um, every year when I take a group to Israel, this is uh, the, the first statue that I like to speak at. And this is a, spa- a statue of Janus Korsha. And uh, you'll see, notice some rocks and stuff. These are stones of remembrance. Uh, it's an honor to have a stone of remembrance placed on your statue. Uh, let me tell you the story of Janus Korsha. He was a champion of Jewish children during the Holocaust. He lived in Warsaw, Poland. He was a pediatrician. And Janusz Korszak had such a burden for children that he became a, a children's author. He wrote children's books and also was a doctor, a pediatrician to children. Finally, he got another burden, and that burden was to stop being a pediatrician and to become the director of the Krochmana Uh, street orphanage in Warsaw, Poland. This orphanage um, had many Jewish children, 13 years of age and under. And he lived up in the attic right there, left his cushy job as a doctor to become the director of this orphanage for children. One day, there came a knock on the door. It was the German soldiers. Of course, everyone knew what that meant. It wasn't good. And the soldiers told uh, Janice Korshak uh, on a certain day, he was to have his children report to this certain place, and uh, if not, they would come with soldiers and, and collect them. Uh, Janice Korshak told his Staff, any of you that want to leave, you go ahead and leave, but I will not forsake my children. Most of his staff remained, and he talked to them and said, I want all of the children to be dressed in their very best clothes. I want them to have their favorite toy in their arms. You tell them we're going on a hike, and we're going to walk through the the forest. And many of these children had never been out of the concrete jungle that was Warsaw, Poland in World War II. Their parents were all killed by the Nazi Germans, and they were left parentless, orphans. At the worst time to be in that area in history. With a little girl in his arm and another by the hand, Janice Korshak led this parade of children, Jewish children, through the forest, and the children were so excited. Some of them had never, ever been in the forest, and they saw birds flying, they saw butterflies, they heard birds chirping and singing, and they were skipping and laughing and holding their toys in their arm. And with a little girl in his arm and one by the hand, Janice Korshak led his children through. On the other side of the forest was a railroad yard. 
And as soon as they got there, there was a German soldier who said, aren't you Janice Korshak? He said, yes. He said, you, you wrote my favorite childhood book? He said, what a great honor it is to meet you. And he shook his hand and he said, wow. He said, I, I'm just so delighted to meet you. And then he looked at all of the children and he said, uh, don't you know what's going on here? And Korshak said, yes, I know. He said, come and I will help you escape. He said, no, I will not forsake my children. And with a little girl in his arm and another by the hand, Janice Korshak led the parade and loaded up the, the railroad car with children. Finally, the train began to move out. And as they stood crammed into that car, they finally came to a stop at a place called Treblinka, 193 Jewish children, ages 2 to 13, were marched off of the train cars and lined up on a sidewalk. Janice Korshak, with a little girl in his arm and one by the hand, was at the front of the parade. And then they were ordered to walk down the corridor and to the open doors of this building and they went into the building, and once they were all inside, the doors were shut and locked. The gas was turned on. And 192 orphans, ages 2 to 13, staff members, and Janice Korshak died in that gas chamber. When they cleared the gas and opened up the doors, they found Janice Korshak still with a little girl in his arm, and one by the hand. Why am I telling you this story? Because this Jewish man would not forsake his children. And 2,000 years ago, there was a Jew who would not forsake you. His name is Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. I don't know if you've ever trusted Christ or not, but Jesus stands with outstretched arms saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Would you bow your heads with me this evening? My heart is burdened for lost souls. Uh, tonight, my purpose in showing you all of these end time prophecies that are being fulfilled or in the process of being fulfilled is to help you understand the urgency of the moment. It's not to be a smart aleck. It's not to be mean-spirited. My, my burden is to help you realize that you need to get saved today. You don't have the promise of tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. I'm glad someone told me about Jesus. I'm glad that I made the choice to receive Christ into my heart. If you're here tonight and you haven't done that, I beg you tonight, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus tonight and be saved. If you are saved, I pray that God would burden your heart as he has mine. It's my purpose for living. It's my vocation to spread the gospel. If you're saved, it's your vocation too. Are you being faithful to the Lord in that respect? We're going to have an invitation in just a moment. I invite you to come. Father in heaven, I pray uh, if there's someone here tonight that needs to be saved, that Father, you would help them realize that Jesus tasted death on the cross of Calvary. He died the death we, we deserve to die. He he died for us, but not just die. He, he rose again, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And because he lives, we can live also. That's the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And anyone who has never been saved, who's never asked Jesus Christ into their heart, who has never repented of their sin and come to Christ, can do that right now. I pray, Father, no one would leave here tonight unsaved. 
And for those of us who are saved, stir our hearts. Cause our hearts to burn within us as they once did. That we might be faithful and more motivated to do that which you would have us to do, which is to tell others about Jesus. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. What page do we have, brother?